Lord be with you. And with his spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, he is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. So two times a year, uh, we wear red. So one is Pentecost. Does anybody know the other one? Don't be shy. Well, it would be uh, Palm Sunday. And so we're wearing it a third time this year in, a, in honor of Pope Benedict, someone that went before us, someone that uh, was a leader for us. And um, that's why we're wearing red. That's where, and so you'll hear some prayers during the Mass today that reference Pope Benedict uh, the 16th, I think it is. Yeah. And so, sorry about that. Anyway, here we go. Um, I just want to let you know why we're red, wearing red here. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of my family that I experienced uh, before getting my career started. Uh, my grandfather, he was my father's father, he worked for a particular railroad company uh, from the time he graduated college um, until he retired. His entire career was spent working for that one company. My father also worked for a particular company. Um, he worked at that company from the time he graduated college until the time he retired. He also spent his entire career working for that one company. So just from my observation of the way this worked in my family, for both my father and my grandfather, I concluded that this is how one should choose to live their life. Now this is not something that was pushed on me, it's not harped on or anything. It just came from me observing. I just kind of watched how things were going on, and I just kind of formulated my beliefs and my, uh, my values. I kind of formulated those around these observations. So in college, you know, when I went through college the first time, I worked hard to make really good grades, try to graduate at the top of my class, and it was all because I was focusing on wanting to be accepted by this one particular company that I was uh, focused on. So the whole time through college, I would everything that I could to earn a spot at that company. And I assumed that once I did that, I would join my life essentially to that company until I would retire. Now the thing is, I made a lot of assumptions along the way that were not quite right. For example, I assumed that the company had an equal interest in uh, keeping me there, you know, as I was wanting to be there, right? Now the thing is, I worked crazy stupid hours. I was like 80 or 90 hours every week for years on end. And I mean, I was like, I was physically in the office 80 or 90 hours. And then like, just to kind of highlight how crazy this got, I mean, one ridiculous time, uh, this was back in the late 80s, early 90s, I um, brought home this, this large Unix workstation and set it up and so that I could work. Because basically the, the plant was shut down, the, the, you know, from like uh, that weekend, the long weekend. Most people weren't working, but I was. So I started working on Friday morning. Worked all the way through Friday, all through Friday night, all through Saturday, all through Saturday night, all through Sunday, all through Sunday night, and then for most of Monday. It's like the sun just kept going up and down, up and down, but I was sitting there at that computer. My work-life balance was nonsense, right? It was just, uh, there was no balance. And it was all because I had this thought about like, you know, we were, I was really, you know, bound up in this company. 
I want to make sure the company is successful, and that way I can, you know, continue to live my life and survive and thrive. You know, but there were these things that would happen. You know, I just couldn't quite square with my beliefs, right? Because people would get laid off, and I was just like, what is that all about? And divisions would close, and people would lose their jobs and have to leave the town. And, you know, it took me a long time, really, but eventually I realized that the world worked different than the way I had assumed all along. It was wrong of me to assume that there was some sort of, like, there's a covenantal bond, really, is what I was thinking, between me and my employer, this company. And so a covenant is something that I understand better now as a Catholic. You know, these covenantal bonds, they're also like a part of Israel's culture, uh, especially in the time of Jesus as depicted in the Old Testament. And a covenant is about a mutual self-giving uh, to each other, and it's a permanent, you know, it, it does not end. You know, I tried to make my work, my employment, that kind of structure. You know, I wanted to give myself uh, for my whole career to the company, and I thought the company would reciprocate, you know, for in indefinitely. You know, I thought we were kind of united for my whole career. But instead, you know, the company and I, we actually entered into a contractual relationship. You know, I give you this, you give me that in return, and we do that as long as we're both into it. And then once one of us is done, then it's over. No hard feelings, okay? You know, that's the contract that I actually signed, right? And that's the relationship that I actually entered into. So that was kind of a painful lesson, just kind of learning that this, this view that I had wasn't quite right. Um, and so I'm going to use this, this painfully gained lesson that I had to highlight a couple of things in today's gospel reading. First, people observe patterns and behaviors around them that will set the way they understand the world. Additionally, the covenantal aspects of Israel's relationships with God and the, the relationships amongst the Israelites themselves, that could be hard for us to grasp in a contractually driven society. But to better understand God, we need to better understand covenant. In today's gospel reading, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I can almost, I can almost guarantee you that when the way you hear those words, it's very different than the way the Israelites heard those words when they were initially spoken. One aspect of that is that, like every year, the Israelites recalled their exit from slavery in Egypt with a Passover feast. It's a big deal. They had to travel all the way to the temple. That was a hard thing to do. And there at the temple, which was huge, is a huge structure, as a part of the Passover, there were hundreds of thousands of lambs. And they were sacrificed on and around this huge altar. It was enormous. And the blood of those lambs was sprinkled for the expiation of sin. So to help with this whole process, there was a river that flowed through and under the temple. And that was used to keep things somewhat sanitary, okay? Otherwise, it would be a huge problem. And so out of the side of the temple flowed blood and water during the Passover sacrifice of all these lambs. Now here's the thing. So later in the Gospel of John, so today's reading was from John, later in this Gospel reading, John makes a point to say that blood and water flowed from the side of Jesus right there as he's being sacrificed. Right there on the cross. And the thing is that you need to understand the timing, okay? When Jesus died and blood and water flowed from his side, that was happening at the exact same time that the temple sacrifice was happening and blood and water was flowing from the side of the temple. So that connects Jesus to the Passover, to the sacrifice of the lamb, and to the expiation of sin. Behold the lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. So this is also wrapped up in this new covenant that Jesus institutes at the Last Supper. We don't have a contract with Jesus, right? It's not that kind of relationship where you exchange this for that, right? Okay, I'll call you Lord and you forgiving my sins. It is much, much better than that. God gives himself completely to us. And we give ourselves completely to God. It's an eternal relationship. It's not like a contract. Now there's one particular element in all of this that I want to highlight it right now, and that is at every Mass, right near the start of the Eucharistic liturgy, the priest says, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. My sacrifice and yours. And then we reply, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. We're talking about the Eucharist here. It is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that allows us to receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus in the Eucharist. And we have a covenantal relationship with Jesus, which is why we have the opportunity to join our sacrifice to his. It is stunningly amazing. We bring to Mass our sacrifice, the things that are hurting us, the things that are not fair to us, tragic things, sad things, painful things. This is where they go. This is where that bad stuff takes on a whole new meaning. Near the end of the Eucharistic liturgy, right before we receive the Eucharist, the priest holds up the Eucharist and says, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. When people talk about participation at Mass. That's what it's about. We offer ourselves to God. Everything. It's a sacrifice. God offers himself to us. Everything. It's a sacrifice. It's a deeply covenantal relationship. You matter. Your suffering matters. What you bring to the altar at this Mass matters.